It's really a great pleasure for me as a president of CSI to interview a very important person as a president of API. I think uh, Sashank Joshi needs no introduction to this audience. He has been the editor of JAPI and he has been the president of API and I think he's the president of many organizations which I even don't recollect. Very powerful and a prolific speaker and a perfect academician with a lot of knowledge about the research, especially in cardio diabetes. Ladies and gentlemen, I present to you Shashank Joshi and I have some very important uh, issues to discuss with you Shashank. The first important issue is about the role of edible oil and then I'll ask you something about the cardio diabetes, how do we manage these people and then what is the role of central aortic pressure or ambulatory blood pressure monitoring and you give all the insights possible uh, which we can manage our patients very well. There has been a lot of issues on the edible aisle, which I'm sure I discussed with you many times in the WHO meeting also, as well as in the ICMR meeting. We'd like to have the words of wisdom from you. Your recommendation as a policy of the government of India and globally about the role of oil and the quality of oil and the composition of oil, which is the best oil in today's scenario which as a message you give it to everyone should be utilized if you want to protect heart problems or the stroke problems in a country like India or to control cardio diabetes. Shashank. So thank you Professor Chopra. I think uh, I should congratulate you because you have been on the epitome of education, prevention, treatment and rehabilitation. And I think it, it credit goes to you for popularizing this. You asked me the most important question. I think one of the single most important question I'm asked in any medical meeting or even lay people meeting where I go is which cooking oil to use, how much to use and what do we do with it. So the answers were very elusive a couple of years back because we were totally wedded to the West and the Western influence of olive oil and canola oil and mustard oil was all there. But the Indian government, particularly their lab, the National Institute of Nutrition and ICMR came out with guidelines based on WHO and FAO recommendations for vegetable oils. We know that not a single vegetable oil meets all the requirements of the fatty acid composition. We need a little bit of saturated fat, we need a little bit of MUFA and we need a little bit of PUFA. What I mean by MUFA is monounsaturated fatty acids. What I mean by PUFA is polyunsaturated fatty acids. So we need to balance all the three. And when you need to balance all the three, we also need the right ratio of omega-3 to omega-6 fatty acid ratio between 1 is to 5 to 1 is to 10. And therefore, the NIN and the Indian government recommended that one should combine or blend oils. And therefore, there have been a lot of studies starting from Japan, then in Australia, which recommended blending of oils. The first study came from Sugano et al, where he blended a blend of rice bran with safflower oil 70-30 and now in India also we have done a randomized control trial to show that these edible oils if you blend them you mix two oils and blend these oils then you will get the properties of two oils into one with a synergy not only just on cholesterol lowering but also on antioxidant parameters oxidized LDL HSCRP and so on and so forth so cardiac biometers also influence see it is very difficult to do an outcome trial on all these oils and therefore, the clear, simple messages to lay people as well as to doctors at large is cook in less oil. Use the right oil, which is usually a blend of an oil. Try to balance MUFA with PUFA because in India, we do consume less PUFA. So we need to balance both to ensure that the right composition of omega-3 to omega-6 is maintained. And therefore, blending is one thing which has emerged consistently and a 7 is to 3 blend of RBO FSFO is something which has been done with some RCTs. We also shown that olive oil is not an Indian oil. We have done data and head to head trial now where we have compared olive oil with an RBO plus oil or RBO safflower blend of 70-30 clearly showing that it is superior to olive oil. So olive oil is not something which we recommend for Indians. It may be useful for Mediterraneans or people who live in south of Europe but is not useful in our population. So for our population, take home message is simple. Cook in less oil, don't reheat the oil, ensure that you use the optimal concentration that is quantity, but also the right quality. So to have the right fatty acid profile, have a blend, maybe a 70-30 blend of SFO with RBO would be a good option which is available and ensure that you integrate 
physical activity with all the nutritional recommendations which are there because we are definitely moving towards a healthy india and if you really want to end a healthy india with cardio metabolic protection then we need to ensure that we need to encourage physical activity behavioral modification and right kind of diet so my prevention mantra is very simple eat less eat right and ensure that you cook in the right oil maybe a blend cook in less oil don't reheat that oil walk more sleep well sleep on time don't be stress free, stressed out don't give stress don't take stress smile shashank i think is very important uh, your statement was maybe blend why maybe blend it should be blend i think blend is the current solution current solution offered to us from nin is the blend and therefore blending is the answer yeah okay to the current uh, situation which is available and we are researching on more and more blends so we am sure indian government doesn't allow a blend beyond two vegetable oils rice blend rice blend oil or safe roll oil mm. uh, the blending is of 70 30 or it's 80 20 what is the recommendation can do both and both the blends are available 80 20 and 70 30 so what if is looking at cardio metabolic prevention probably 70 30 blend and and 80 20 could be more for the patients and that is something which we are, our lab is currently investigating what should be the right ratio to not only just balance pufa and mufa but to balance the omega 3 to omega 6 ratio because the ratio changes from 80 is to 1 to sometimes 12 is to 1 and therefore 70 30 currently has a ratio of 80 is to 1 and that is what we are trying to recommend so i think the message is very clear by dr sashank joshi that if you really want to use a so called ideal oil edible oil in your food to prevent the cardio metabolic issues or diabetes control or reduce the morbidity and mortality i think the best oil is a blended oil and the blend should be 70 30 is the right recommendation and he use also one word which is very important is optimization of the ratio of omega 3 and omega 6 the recommendation by shashank based on the evidence based data is 1 is to 5 to 1 is to 10 which is feasible practical and available with an oil which is easily available in india at a very low cost is a blended oil which is a combination of rice bran oil and safe flour oil and there has been a lot of controversy which of course shashank did not highlight that there is a total condemning of olive oil and the mustard oil also is in a great controversy people don't use it anymore because mustard oil has been shown in the various studies from cochin that the requirement of pacemaker is very high it produces lot of uh, degenerative disorders in the six in the vicinity of sinus node people don't use it and shashank himself told in the interaction just few days a uh, few hours back that uh, there was a lot of papers on the gallbladder cancer and mustard oil relationship and lot of lot of issues were discussed and i think the overall consensus was the blending of oil is very important shashank also mentioned not only double blending triple blending may be the answer and i think he mentioned on triple blending is the application of soya bean i think in the years to come the blending will be more refined and more defined and that will be the most appropriate oil for us thank you shashank for giving a very appropriate and a very scientific validation in your proposition for the use of oil in our daily life the second question which i really want to ask you shashank we see that we are the world capital of diabetes we are the world capital of cad and we are also going to be the world capital of metabolic syndrome and hypertension in the years to come we like to know how we can curtail the rising menace of diabetes in a country like ours what are the modalities and the second question is on the blood pressure people talk a lot about central aortic heart pressure measurement is it really authentic is it really useful and number 2 how about the role of ambulatory blood pressure monitoring please address this is very very important practically not only for general public but also for doctors and pg students give your words of wisdom shashank so you ask me a plethora of questions and i think it's very difficult to answer but i will try to do justice to all of them i think the first thing which you say is we are the metabolic syndrome capital of the world we have cardio metabolic disease we are of course the second largest country in the world but it is just not because china is one and india is two and the geography of india and china is large and the population is large which is why we are having this high incidence of heart disease or it's basically because we have changed our socio economic graph very quickly we have become affluent 
we have become urbanized, we are living in concrete jungles and our physical activity has gone down tremendously. So, we are eating the wrong foods, we are not eating foods on time, we are all wedded to fast food cultures which is very, very detrimental to our health. We are having, we are wedded to colas which are nothing but sugar bombs because if you have any cola for any ma matter of fact, it is 13 teaspoonfuls of sugar and therefore, it is something which we need to ban it. It is worse than cigarette smoking I feel sometimes. Then we eat a lot of foods which have trans fats which is not good at all. It is going to lead to a lot of hypertension and diabetes. We are a salt capital of the world. We consume too much of salty foods. It is not just sugars. Sugar is one bomb. And you know that WHO has recently de declared that sugar became, could be equivalent to tobacco. But we also eat too much of salt and that leads to a lot of hypertension. And that is something which we know our papads, the pickles, we, the chutneys which we eat, they have a lot of indirect invisible salt and that sodium needs to be curtailed. So, the, the twin epidemic of hypertension and diabetes is exploding in India very rapidly, very quickly, very fast. And then we have westernization through multinationals which are trying to influence our culture. For example, they are trying to insert cornflakes in our breakfast. Cornflakes are poison flakes. You cannot have them. You need to have traditional Indian breakfast. The best food is what our grandmothers cooked. But probably we have to compound it with physical activity and then probably use functional foods. So, probably if you really want to stand cardio diabetes epidemic, we really need to make an effort on diet, exercise and living happily because we are continuously living in a stressed out environment. We are not sleeping on time, we are not eating well and therefore, I think we really need to stem this epidemic of diabetes. Diabetes is nothing but too much of carbs, too much of fat and too little proteins. So, Indians are thin fat Indians and because we are thin and fat, that means what happens with us is we put a lot of fat in our abdomen or, or our body, our body composition and that is why we have generation of blood pressure as well as this thing. In fact, we have done studies to show you just cut the carb the simple sugars and you know, even your blood pressure will come down just by restricting sugar and salt. And I think these are simple things which you need to do. Then you highlight two important tenets in blood pressure monitoring. One is central aortic pressure and secondary is the role of ambulatory blood pressure monitoring. We all know the white coat effect. We all know that we need to do away with the mercury manometer. But I still feel that we measure it because some of these uh, machines, the electronic gadgets may not be absolutely sacrosanct to measure it. 24 hour blood pressure monitoring is here to stay and it is ambulatory blood pressure monitoring. It is like a, a graph which you get which actually tells you two things which are critically important. One is the nocturnal blood pressure because a nocturnal surge of blood pressure which occurs early morning is actually the killer pressure. And if you need to pick that up and you need to ensure that the night time blood pressure and the nocturnal dipping has to be picked up, you need to do a 24 hour blood pressure monitoring. Secondly, when you are free living outside, and when you do a 24 hour blood pressure monitoring, you clearly get an idea independent of the doctor's office which eliminates the white coat effect to some extent, I would not say totally, but we will try to get you and delineate blood pressure control better because there is a lot of blood pressure variability, individual, individual and intra-individual. That means within the same individual on three different days, maybe a weekday, a day when he has a meeting and when he has a no meeting, if you do blood pressure measurement, you will get a blood pressure variability. We can even measure glucose variability like that, but blood pressure variability is important. Also, just doing a 120-80 goal, a blood pressure is not enough. You need to measure central aortic pressure because if you measure that and you highlight that, you can get into that better. So, it is important to recognize that because I am a metabolic physician beyond central aortic pressure and 24-hour blood pressure monitoring, we need to look at the kidneys. Kidneys are the prime targets of uncontrolled hypertension and therefore, the glomerular hypertension leaks out as microalbumin and that does not get controlled and that is where medications like ACE or ARBs, mainly ACE, I think ARBs have been wrongly propounded. I feel ACE still remains the cornerstone just because of the over highlighting of cough. People have really not done and looked at the robust outcome data which HOPE trial had that you need to ensure that you need to take care of that blood pressure in the kidney which comes out as microalbumin much before actual hypertension comes up. And therefore, it is important to recognize that we have agents like ACE inhibitors which can be game changers, tissue specific ACE inhibitors like say ramipril or perindropril which can make a difference to the microalbumin, save you the kidneys because we are having a big renal failure problem which is coming up. And when you have blood pressure and diabetes combined together as a twin epidemic, the geopardy is actually propounded not in arithmetic proportion, but in geometric proportion. But I still feel Dr. Chopra, the answer is in prevention. I congratulate you 
for having this outstanding world, tenth world conference on preventive cardiology because you have been consistently highlighting on preventive cardiology. The, the era of clinical cardiology and preventive cardiology has taken a back seat because we are in era of interventional cardiology. But we need to remember that we need to intervene through prevention. Prevention is the best intervention because I think that is what superior doctors are supposed to do. I think uh, Dr. Shang Joshi has given a very, very clear cut and a very vivid viewpoint that it is the preventive cardiology which is your real intervention and not the intervention as a preventive cardiology. Dr. Shashank was very categoric and very specific that there is so much of variability in a second to second, minute to minute, in event to event in the blood pressure at times it is not possible to know where what is happening and every individual is different. He used one very specific word morning surge of blood pressure which is not same in every individual. It is different in different people and the role of central OT blood pressure is very very important which is a real hallmark to decide the therapy in most of the patients. And second thing about the ambulatory blood pressure monitoring. I think the data is very clear. He says blood pressure load. If a person has got a more systolic load or a diastolic load at a certain point of time, which we can see by ambulatory blood pressure monitoring, we can control it very well. And the role of AC inhibitors before the microalbuminuria sets in. He said it's a preventive strategy. People use a very less dose of uh, ACE inhibitors like ramipril. They should use a higher dose or at least an optimum dose and should not be scared of a uh, side effect like a cough. But we should really prevent the damage to the kidneys. So I think it's a very, very important message uh, given by Shashank Joshi on uh, the morbidity and mortality produced by uncontrolled hypertension and uncontrolled diabetes in individuals. So meticulous control is the answer and it's possible if we follow the patients very carefully clinically, give them all the preventive strategies and use the medicines in a very meticulous manner and follow them up so that there is no entry of the morbidity on a long term basis and the role of central aortic pressure is very well highlighted and ambulatory blood pressure monitoring. I have to ask you one thing uh, Shashank. We see a lot of elderly patients after the age of 55 or 60 and we see a lot of postural hypertension in these patients which is either iatrogenic by some drugs or it is because of autonomic insufficiency produced by diabetes itself. So we are a little choosy in some drugs uh, intervention and we see also some patients uh, who are beta blockers for a long time as they grow old because of autonomic insufficiency there is a little variable requirement of beta blockers. We like you to highlight on the role of intervention, drug intervention in elderly and the role of ambulatory blood pressure monitoring in elderly and the central aortic pressure in elderly. So elderly postural hypotension what you are talking about is a very important entity and many a times the drug culprit drugs are the drugs. But I think if you are able, because we have a larger menu available with us, this is the time when we can use it better. Secondly, systolic blood pressure is chased above 60 more aggressively. But the guidelines have actually come down on the aggressiveness of tight blood pressure control. And therefore, we need to recognize that, particularly in the elderly population, particularly when you are having a situation of an autonomic dysfunction or a situation where you are leading to a lot of postural hypotension. So these are the situations where the degree of blood pressure control needs to be optimized. 24 hour blood pressure monitoring or central aortic pressure does come as a tool and a rescue tool to us, but I think we need to balance out. Sometimes we have to investigate some of these patients who have consistent orthostatic hypotension and sometimes add a fludrocortisone sometimes there in some of these patients, particularly because we could see that there could be a salt deficiency and a cortisol deficiency. So you need to recognize sometimes and delineate some of these patients who get recurrent orthostatic hypotension. Also autonomic dysfunction, once it sets in, it is actually a very poor prognosticator and a lot of our patients do have autonomic dis uh, insufficiency and you need to investigate it systematically and treat it systematically. And we do have drugs like fludrocortisone from the endocrinology standpoint which we can use appropriately so that we can handle this difficult problem particularly in elderly of postural hypotension better. Currently we are living in a good era. I say we are living in a good era because we are in an era where therapeutics is at its peak 
but we still need more and more tools to pick up responders and non-responders and to pick up people who will develop side effects and probably a day will come through SNPs or genome chips where it is possible for us to identify that a patient will develop postural hypertension, second patient will not develop postural hypertension and I am certain that just by giving 0.1 ml of blood, we will be able to find out who will get postural hypertension, who will not get postural hypertension and I think that will be most useful, the pharmacogenomic tools will be most useful probably in the elderly population. Dr. Shashan Joshi, I think you give a very good remark that AC inhibitors is the mainstay for the treatment so far as prevention of microalbuminuria is concerned. But there is a recently a lot of uh, discussion on ARB, uh, AC inhibitor, no doubt about it. In ARB also, there is a lot of uh, debate uh, to use telmisartan or olmisartan. What's your viewpoint on the telmisartan versus olmisartan or telmisartan is the answer, olmisartan is the answer? What do you say on this? So I think, let me make this very clear. If you look from pure cardiovascular outcome trials, the data was consistent from the largest trial which was HOPE trial on ramipril and subsequently on tissue specific ACE inhibitors. So consistent CV outcome data was with ACE inhibitors. Whenever ACE inhibitors was intolerant, then one moves to ARB. Unfortunately, in India, we see that the tom toming of ARBs was more powerful and just fundamentally because of that, you see that the sartans have gained credence. Sartans had a challenge. If you look at some of the data in Sartans, they actually increased incidence of myocardial infarction, of course, and that has been put under a lot of scrutiny. So, Sartans are definitely not my first choice agents, particularly when I am looking from the cardiovascular or myocardial infarction standpoint. It will always be an ACE inhibitor and if there is an intolerance, then probably I would move to a Sartan. Among the Sartans, the metabolic Sartan is Telmi Sartan and therefore, that has gained a wide popularity overall because of its metabolic impact on overall blood pressure control and the freedom from the cough or the bradykinin side effects which are predominantly the kinin bradykinin pathway which predominantly led to a lot of cough and that cough is wo made worse because we are living in a polluted environment and that is why probably it gets highlighted in a much bigger way and therefore then I would probably take a pick on tell me sartan that does not mean other sartans are not good enough. Sartans have now consistently shown more and more data but I think if you look at the cardiology wisdom. And if you look at even from the metabolic standpoint of wisdom, the data is most robust and scientific with ACE and if there is a challenge of intolerance, then the sartans come in play and among the sartans probably the popular sartan has been tell me sartan mainly because of its metabolic impact and the outcome they have generated. I think the message is very clear that the drug of choice is ACE inhibitors on first priority and in case there is intolerance or some not acceptability of this drug, we can go for sartan. And after the sartan, the best is tell me sartan because there is a huge data. There is a huge evidence based data in sartan with tell me sartan as compared to all me sartan and other sartans. And I think this message should be taken uh, practically and use ACE inhibitors as the first drug of choice if you really want to do a cardio protection and reduce the prevalence of microalbuminuria. And ambulatory blood pressure monitoring should be used more often. Central aortic pressure monitoring should be done more often so that we can really reduce the morbidity and mortality produced by uncontrolled hypertension or uncontrolled diabetes. I am very grateful to you, Shashank, for being with us and giving your message on the role of oil, role of drugs, and the role of non-pharmacological methods also. And aim is ultimate to reduce the morbidity and mortality which is cardiodiabetes inflicted. Thank you very much.